Okay, hello everyone. Let's start at six, six o'clock. Welcome to lecture number six of the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics lecture series. And let me start by first reminding you where we are. Uh, right now we have looked into Bell's inequalities and we first arrived at the way that John Bell did it in 1964. Uh, but then we quickly switched to a generalization that is due to Closer, Holt, Horn, and Shimoni. And the idea, again, uh, as in any of the Bell's inequalities, is to analyze the statistics of an experiment where you uh, have a source producing two particles, and these particles can be measured. And at the measurement stations, you even have the choice of different measurement settings. So in mathematical formal language, um, what you do is uh, what is written down here. So you say maybe at measurement station A, I can have two settings, A or A prime, which might be the direction in which along which you measure a spin. And likewise at measurement station B, I have two settings, B and B prime. And then if you perform the experiment, um, you will obtain measurement results that might be up or down for a spin, which can be labeled plus one or minus one. And these would give the values for these um, random variables, capital A, capital A prime, B and B prime. So these are the measurement results for the corresponding settings at the corresponding station. Now, the aim of Clauser, Holthorn and Shimoni was to generalize what John Bell had done to have as, uh, as little extra assumptions as possible. And among many things, they got rid of the assumption that every particle is necessarily detected because in a real experiment where maybe you send around photons, uh, you might lose some of these particles. So they have an additional entry in this table of pos possible measurement results, which would be zero. And zero just means no detection. They also don't assume that if you have parallel measurement axes, then necessarily you will get the perfect quantum mechanical results, which would be for a singlet state, a perfect uh, anti-parallel um, spin alignment that also isn't assumed. So in the end, you just have four random variables, A, B, A prime, B prime, that can take on uh, three values and you want to see what constraints are there for the statistics. And then we went through a few short lines of math and came up with an inequality that the combinations of correlators of these random variables always have to fulfill. So this particular combination shown here on the left-hand side must be bounded by two. And that's the famous CHHS inequality. And that's really what is being used today and it holds for any local hidden variable theory um, if the measurement results take on either of the three values um, and there are no further assumptions in there. Now I have to make, uh, make it clear where exactly does the fact that we're dealing with a local hidden variable theory enter here because maybe it's not so clear at first sight. And that's a little bit hidden in the notation. And so let me mention it. So um, the locality is really hidden. Um, all of these results are only there for local hidden variable theory because the value of A does only depend on the measurement setting A. So capital A, remember this is an abbreviated notation really stands for the measurement result obtained at station A, given the measurement direction little a, and given a certain value of the hidden variable. And this value we assume is independent of the other setting. So it doesn't depend on the other measurement direction little b. which means in our formulas, when we uh, derive these formulas, 
when we derive these formulas, um, when we write A times B, what we really mean is uh, the measurement result at station A for little a and lambda times the corresponding result for B. And when we correspondingly write A, B prime, what we mean is actually the same value of A of A comma lambda. And we multiply that with a presumably different value uh, for the other measurement direction. So the fact that these are the same that means we have localities. So the value of A doesn't depend on what we do at station B. Well, so CHHS is the version used in modern analysis. And uh, one thing we can ask ourselves, again, just like for the original Bell's inequality, what about quantum mechanics? If we have a, say, quantum mechanical singlet state, uh, then what would be the result for CHHS? And again, this will depend on the measurement directions. So you have to choose them carefully. And one potential choice of measurement directions is the one I'm drawing right here. So there would be A and B, and there's an angle of pi quarter in between them. And then there is A prime and B prime. And again, these are similarly angles of pi quarter. So if you now work out what that means for the quantum mechanical results, for example, the correlator between the A and B measurement results, we already know how to calculate this. We just have minus the cosine of the angle between these two directions. And that's just minus one over square root of two. And likewise, you can go through all the other correlators and then you can add them up and work out the left-hand side of um, the CHHS inequality. And what you end up with is two times square root of two. And this is obviously larger than the right-hand side bound, uh, which was two. In other words, there is a conflict between the predictions of quantum mechanics for this particular experiment, if you measure in these particular directions between the predictions of quantum mechanics for the situation and local and variable theories. Now, at the time this was derived, it might well, very well have been that this is only a conflict between the predictions of quantum theory and that nature actually in these particular situations disagrees with quantum theory. Um, so the ultimate test, whether we have a problem uh, for local and variable theories, the ultimate test is really an experiment. So then finally, um, going on, um, I just want to briefly come back to Merman's Gedanken experiment. You remember this, um, where we had three settings at each uh, detector station, and where the rule was that if you measure with the same settings, then you would get the same results. And if you measure with different settings, you would get uh, different results. The results were announced by colorful lights, red or green. But of course, you understand that this is just um, a fanciful way to dress up everything. So um, it turns out that you can get exactly the results of Merman's Gedanken experiment um, if you have spin one half and if you have a singlet state and you cleverly arrange uh, 
a mapping between these uh, three possible settings and the measurement directions. So um, this mapping is quite simple. Um, for example, at station A, we would say that the three measurement directions are indeed arranged in this star-like fashion with 120 degree angles. And in station B, we just turn it around. So these are just the opposite directions. For example, three is pointing down, not up. And one is pointing to the upper right and so on. Um, so that would be the directions at B. And it turns out that if you then uh, look at the results for the same setting, then you, got, uh, you get the same measurement result. The reason is that uh, these measurement directions are opposite to each other. So the spins themselves are also opposite. Um, and uh, the way this works out, you get the same results. And if you have completely random settings, you can try this for yourself. It's a little exercise. Uh, then um, quantum mechanics also predicts that you'll get, um, on average, completely random results. So um, this is how this is what stands behind it. So all the experiments that are being done to test those inequalities could also be um, slightly modified in order to give you the results of Merman's Gedanken experiment. Okay, so now I thought I go ahead and tell you a little bit about all the possible experiments, the possible experimental implementations of Bell's inequalities that one can have. So that will be our next little, oops, our next little section. And there are three classes really of physical systems one can think of when trying to implement such an experiment. So the first would be simple spin systems like electron spins or nuclear spins. And the second class would be photons with a polarization. And the third class, if you like, uh, would be arbitrary controllable two-level systems, also known as qubits. So I will now try to say a little bit about each of these categories. And the nice thing is this also is just a nice tour through physics. Now, since um, I will have to show you many pictures, I, I thought I'd prepare some of them in advance. Um, so uh, the first, if you ask yourself, when can I have a singlet state for electrons? Well, you need uh, two electrons, obviously. What's the simplest atom where you have two electrons? Well, it's the helium atom. And so this is the simplest situation. Uh, if you look to the right, you would see the energy spectrum of the single particle uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And then um, you would start to occupy the lowest uh, single particle state, the single particle ground state with two electrons. According to the Pauli principle, they have to have opposite spins. And if you look at it closely, actually they are in a singlet state. Because you know that the wave function of two fermions has to be overall anti-symmetric. It will have an orbital part and a spin part in this case. The orbital part is symmetric because both of them are sitting in the same orbital. And so the spin part has to be anti-symmetric. And if these are spin one half particles, the only choice here is the singlet state. So if you were to go ahead and ionize such an atom, 
then you would find the two electrons are in a singlet state and you could do all the bell test measurements. Whenever I display such a physical example, that doesn't mean that this is the example that is very well suited for actual practical experiments and helium atom ionization is not the typical bell test experiment that people would do, but it's at least a possibility. Here's another possibility that people have considered if you go to more electrons. The point is whenever you have a situation similar to the helium atom, so you have individual, individual single particle states being occupied with uh, electrons up and down, uh, then if you have a situation with an even number of electrons, uh, you can easily end up with um, having, say, the two electrons in the uppermost um, energy level, this one here, uh, in a singlet state. And if you are careful enough and you extract the electrons from the state, then again, you will have a singlet state and you can try to measure the spin polarizations and you will find that in principle, at least you could violate a bell's inequality. There is another system where you even form uh, very well-defined uh, pairs of electrons. And these are the so-called Cooper pairs uh, you have in a superconductor. So if there is some residual attractive interaction between the electrons, then um, you form so-called Cooper pairs in the simplest superconductors. They are in a singlet state. And so people have actually not only suggested, but also implemented experiments where you would have a superconducting metallic island and you would bring another metallic tip close by and you would arrange voltages such that it is favorable for a single Cooper pair to occasionally tunnel across the barrier, across the gap between the metal pieces of metal. And then uh, later on, you could try to split this Cooper pair and analyze the individual electron spins and you would find that they are in a singlet state. There was a question about the Fermi C. Um, well, what one can do is also here for a Fermi C in order to extract uh, exactly the electrons one wants, one can do a tunneling experiment. And uh, so one brings another piece of material close by, which is able to receive electrons. And then depending on which voltages one applies, one can make it such that energy conservation will only allow, say, the highest, the electrons from the highest occupied orbital to tunnel out of, um, to tunnel out of your object, and all the others are stuck because of energy reasons. And so that's the way one would extract controllably only one single state. Okay, good. So now these are Cooper pairs. And again, such experiments have actually been done, but these are not among the most powerful Bell test experiments. The problem is a little bit to bring them to sufficiently large distances in order to fulfill this locality condition, which we already discussed a little bit before and which we will discuss again. Now, um, there are other spinful particles, of course. For example, if you have nuclei uh, in atoms, then they can also have a spin. And so this picture would show you an electron cloud surrounding two nuclei in a molecule. And uh, if the situation is right, then you could have a single state for the two nuclei. A very famous example is actually the hydrogen molecule. So the nuclei are just protons. Each proton has a spin one half. And if the two spin one half are in a singlet state, it's called parahydrogen. Again, because uh, we're dealing with fermions, there are constraints on the symmetry of the total wave function. So um, if the spin state is a singlet, you can have um, a symmetric orbital wave function. And so, um, yeah, you can try to in principle, split such a molecule and then you would have the nuclei in a single state. This has been at least proposed and to some extent um, implemented uh, also for other molecules. Here's another interesting opportunity. Instead of trying to find a system where the particles are already in a singlet state, 
you can also have scattering situations. And this is at least historically important because it was one of the first situations in which both tests were performed. So even if you don't have any magnetic dipole-dipole interactions or anything, the Pauli principle alone guarantees that scattering is typically spin dependent. So the reason is, of course, again, if you have identical particles like fermions, then there are constraints on the total wave function. And for example, for fermions, the total wave function should be anti-symmetric. So if the spins are in a singlet state, which is already anti-symmetric, then the orbital uh, part of the wave function will be symmetric. Symmetric in particular also means that uh, you can find the two particles at the same spot at the same time. That is not forbidden in this case. And that's of course good to find them at the same spot at the same time, because if there is some interaction between them, then that can mean they can scatter. And so it turns out that if you have fermions with short range interaction, for the reason I just explained, uh, if you send them in with arbitrary spins, so sometimes you can think of it sometimes being a singlet state, sometimes a triplet state, then scattering will happen predominantly when they're in a singlet state. So if you then detect the particles uh, flying off in different directions, so the scattering has taken place, you automatically select for particles in a singlet state. And then if you measure them, if you measure the spin, you can perform a Bell experiment. So that's spin dependent scattering. Now, these were all spins and therefore typically material particles like electrons or nuclei. Another very important class, I already mentioned it, are photons. And so since we haven't said too much about photons so far, I thought I have a little reminder for everyone about photons because I don't know what's your background. Now, the easiest way to think of photons is to start with a situation where you don't have the electromagnetic field in free space, but it's confined, uh, like in a cavity between two mirrors. Then even classical electromagnetism tells us that there are standing waves between those mirrors. They are also called cavity modes. And each of these cavity modes uh, really corresponds, even classically, to a harmonic oscillator. Because, for example, the electric field oscillates in a sinusoidal fashion, just like the coordinate of a harmonic oscillator. Now, if you treat a harmonic oscillator quantum mechanically, of course, you know that, uh, well, it is a parabolic potential and the energies turn out to be equally spaced where the spacing is proportional to the frequency of the harmonic oscillator. So the energy spacing is H bar omega. So the energy would be H bar omega times N plus one half. Now the N is the number of excitations in this harmonic oscillator either zero if you don't have any excitation, so you're in the ground state, or one, two, three, and so on. But in this context, if the harmonic oscillator belongs to an electromagnetic field, you call the excitations also photons. So the number of photons is exactly equal to the number of excitations in this harmonic oscillator. And then in principle, you can have many cavity modes, say with different wavelengths or different transverse electromagnetic mode functions, each of them belongs to its own harmonic oscillator. And each of these harmonic oscillators can be occupied with a different number of excitations, a different number of photons. So that's the basic meaning of photon. Now, for our purposes, of course, in the end, we need something like a singlet state. And we need to look for an additional degree of freedom that maybe has just two possible values that can represent the spin because the photon itself doesn't have the, at least not the same kind of spin one half that the electron has. Now this can be brought about by looking at polarization. And again, classically in electromagnetism, if your cavity, at least if your cavity is nicely symmetric and so on, for each uh, mode that is polarized with the electric field, say pointing along the vertical direction, there is another mode, uh, if everything is symmetric, even at the same frequency, where the electric field has a horizontal polarization. So vertical, I mean, uh, pointing up, 
and horizontal is just the direction perpendicular to it. And I tried to somehow um, indicate this here in the graphics. So each of these is a different electromagnetic mode, a standing wave mode inside the cavity. Each of these belongs to a different harmonic oscillator. And each of these harmonic oscillators when treated quantum mechanically can be placed in some um, excitation state. For example, here the vertical mode has uh, two photons and the horizontal mode would have one photon. That's how I draw the situation. So now that's uh, polarization and modes. There's another aspect we have to discuss. So if you then do an actual Bell experiment, you will typically talk about photons that travel through space instead of being trapped in a cavity. But the nice thing is this can be treated in exactly the same framework, just instead of having these standing wave modes that are trapped and don't travel, uh, you would have traveling modes. So think of them as electromagnetic wave packets. And again, each such wave packet corresponds to a harmonic oscillator. You can have uh, wave packets of different wavelength, of course, and also of different location. And you can actually construct a full basis of such electromagnetic traveling wave modes in the same manner that you can construct a full basis of electromagnetic standing waves inside a cavity. And these traveling modes, just like the cavity modes, again, also can have two different polarizations. So that brings us close to how the actual experiments have to be described with these traveling wave modes, but the mathematics remains the same. Okay. Now, just to keep our notation brief, uh, I might in the following just say, look, if I have one photon or if I want to look at, the mo at these traveling wave modes, they come in two polarizations, vertical and horizontal, V or H. And I might uh, use this notation where I talk of the state V, by which I mean uh, one of those vertically polarized modes. I omit here in this notation uh, the actual spatial shape of the mo mode. So which wavelength and which location and so on. And that would have to be specified in addition, but sometimes for brevity, we omit it. Okay, so now each of these modes can still be occupied with many photons in principle. You could have seven photons in one of these modes and three in the other. But for a Bell experiment, in the end, we only had, say, two electrons. And likewise here, I want to have only two photons. And so, um, what we have to do now is first we say that instead of spin one half pointing up or down, I have a polarization horizontal or vertical. And then I will construct a two photon state out of these modes. So uh, let us have a look at this. When I write this here, H1, what I mean is there's exactly one photon currently occupying this mode where the subscript one maybe indicates at which place in space is this mode, along which path is it traveling. And the H of course indicates the polarization. And then I take the product with another state um, where at location two, there is a vertically polarized photon. So H one times V two is already a two photon state. But in order to have an entangled state, I shouldn't just have a product state. I should um, have another contribution. This is the second term. And so then HV minus VH, this is the equivalent uh, wave function equivalent to the singlet state for the electrons. And so to make it really, really clear, I also tried to draw the same situation below. So um, one and two are just two different locations in space at which these uh, wave packets are located. And uh, in the first part of my wave function, I have, say, a horizontally polarized mode being occupied with one photon at location one and a vertical photon at location two. And then I subtract from that the other configuration where the roles are interchanged. So this is what this wave function means. <clears throat> 
in all contributions, there's exactly two photons, but they are distributed onto different modes. If I want to be really precise, I could also say there are actually four modes involved here yeah? because there's the mode that is horizontal at location one, vertical at location one, horizontal at location two, vertical at location two. So strictly speaking, in this game, at least in the subspace where I construct my wave function, there will be four harmonic oscillators, one for each of these modes. But all the contributions to my wave functions are to my wave function are constructed such that only exactly two of these four harmonic oscillators are excited at any time. For example, H1 and V2, the other two harmonic oscillators are in their ground state. So this is another way to represent this wave function. Is this uh, clear so far? I will say a little bit more about how to measure things, but uh, is what I say so far clear? Well, it seems so. Just stop me at any time if something becomes unclear. Um, now, how do you measure photons? We said for electrons, you maybe bring them into a magnetic field in order to separate spin up from spin down. Um, here you have to resort to different, to different uh, purposes. Oh, there's a first question. How do we produce the singlet state? Um, I haven't yet described it in detail. I will come to that once we finish our little excursion about photons, I come to a few physical examples where you can actually produce such wave functions. Okay. Oh. Um, so, um, there's another question. I didn't get why some polarization had lower energies in the previous slide. Uh, no polarization had lower energy. So maybe you're referring to what's shown here. Uh, but what that means is just that some of these modes are presently not occupied at all. So they have zero photons. And some of these modes are presently occupied with exactly one photon. So that's the idea. And of course, if there is a photon, yes, then there is some energy in this mode. If there is no photon, then there is no energy. But that's all of it. Yeah, it's not that the, somehow vertical would have higher energy than horizontal per se. Okay, I hope this got clear. So now let me turn to measurement. Um, one simple way to perform measurement on photons is via polarizers. So if you have a polarizer, that just means it lets, it lets pass radiation that is say linearly polarized in a certain direction and it blocks other polarization. So what I'm showing here is a vertical polarizer that would pass, let pass the vertically polarized photon. So if it goes in, it will also come out. And on the other hand, a horizontal photon would be blocked. So that's easy enough and then Afterwards, you put a photon detector and you get a click if it was indeed vertically polarized. Now it's interesting to see what happens if you if you want to represent different angles of the polarization instead of vertical and horizontal. And the way to do it in the quantum language is uh, uh, to have a superposition state of horizontal and vertical. For example, here I have an equal superposition. And then that would correspond to a 45 degree uh, direction of the polarization, linear polarization between horizontal and vert vertical. And you can basically choose any angle between these two directions. This directly corresponds to also the uh, description of polarization in classical electromagnetism in Maxwell's equation, uh, where you would um, say if the, the electric field has two components the, along the x and the y direction, if both of them are present, then the polarization is at an intermediate angle between the x and the y direction. Now, if I take such a state, an equal superposition of H and V, and try to transmit it through a polarizer, then uh, say tr try to transmit it through this polarizer, then I would only transmit the vertical part and that is only by probability only 50% of the whole state. 
So it would show up as 50% transmission. So uh, you get a click at the detector that is placed behind the polarizer only in 50% of the attempts. Now, one can be a little bit better because using such a polarizer, you never know if you don't get a click, is it because there was no photon to start with or is it because it had the wrong polarization? And so eventually over time, people began to use slightly more sophisticated setups, namely so-called polarizing beam splitters. So here you have a piece of um, transparent material glued up in just the right manner, some piece of dielectric that will reflect one polarization and transmit the other polarization. This is of course much better because now you can place two detectors, one in one uh, beam path and the other in the other beam path. And then these two detectors will always detect your photon regardless of the polarization. So either it comes out vertical or horizontal, that's the idea. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, I just want to make a little comparison between spin one half and photons. So for spin one half, uh, we know of course, everything depends on the choice of basis. The typical basis we choose is say, to pick an axis like the Z axis, and then to say whether the spin is pointing up or down along this axis. For the photon, the corresponding states uh, would then and be horizontal or vertical. Of course, this um, making this correspondence, that's a little bit my arbitrary choice that I say up in the Z direction would correspond to H, down in the Z direction would correspond to V. So that's my arbitrary mapping, but these are two valid basis states. Now, what happens if I look at other directions? In the spin case, we already learned that if I want to have an up spin in the x direction, so an eigen uh, vector of the spin operator in the x direction, that would be a superposition of uh, up in the z direction and down in the z direction. And likewise, uh, spin down in the x direction is this kind of superposition with a minus. Um, let me stop for a moment because I see another question. If we have the ground state, so n equals zero, how can it have a polarization if there is no photon in the wave packet? Okay, thank you for the question. So the, the way one likes to view this is to say, there is an electromagnetic mode just classically calculated from Maxwell's equations, for example, confined in a cavity. This mode has a shape and a polarization and a wavelength and a location. And this mode corresponds to a harmonic oscillator. Now this harmonic oscillator could be in the ground state. Then we would say it has zero excitations and no extra energy beyond the ground state energy. Or it can have one excitation or two and so on. And then we say there's one photon, two photons and so on. But this mode always exists even if it's in its ground state. So that's the thinking. And therefore it also has a polarization and a location and so on. So to speak, think of it like a container. It can contain zero, one, two, three photons, but it's always there. This container, this mode is always there. There's another question. Why the photon superposition makes sense also classically, but the spin superposition doesn't? Oh, that's an interesting, um, very interesting question. Uh, so, one of the things here is that when we dealt with spins, at least the way we dealt with them, we were thinking of fermions and uh, there's only one fermion at most in a given state at any uh, given time. Whereas here we are thinking of photons which are bosons, so there can be many of them in the same state at the same time, uh, which is what we are representing here with many photons being in a given mode. Um, so that's one answer, yeah? difference between fermions and bosons. But uh, you can also have, um, in principle, you can try to 
look at larger spins. Um, for example, if you have a little nano magnet composed of many different spin and one halves, you can look at the total spin. And then in principle, you could, uh, um, then you can go to a kind of semi-classical limit. So this uh, big spin will sometimes behave as if it were a classical spin vector. Uh, um, so that helps a little bit to also op obtain a classical limit there. And then you can even try to produce uh, superposition states where this big spin uh, points, so to speak, simultaneously up and down, but this is getting a little bit ahead. So this is already the domain of Schrodinger cats. Uh, someone else asks, is there a photon for n equals zero? No, n equals zero means zero photons, n equals one means one photon, n equals two means two photons. So that's the language we use. I mean, you understand all of this is language, so to speak. Okay. So back to maybe this little comparison table. Uh, it, for the spin one half, we can say, oh, if it points in the x direction, uh, that is really a superposition of pointing up or down in the z direction. And likewise, we already said that uh, for the photon also, I can have a superposition of say, horizontal plus vertical. And at least I argued that this would be polarized along the 45 degree direction. Um, if, if it's minus, uh, then it would be polarized in the other 45 degree direction. Um, you could, uh, in principle, check these things for yourself if you occupy such a mode with a large number of photons and build a more macroscopic uh, state, so to speak. You can literally evaluate the expectation value of the electric field operator. And it will teach you that indeed, yes, you are polarized 45 degree in, say, one of these cases. And then finally, uh, it's interesting to see the correspondence uh, when I have spin one half in the y direction, uh, again, we maybe mentioned briefly the shape of the eigenvectors uh, as, as written down in the z basis. So they have this little i here. Um, and you can try to form similar combinations out of the horizontal and vertical polarizations for the photons. And it turns out that if you then analyze them, what you really have constructed in this way um, are circularly polarized states. So either clockwise or counterclockwise circularly polarized states. Again, this is most easily confirmed if you then, uh, for example, look at the uh, expectation value of the electric field operator. And then it's like in classical Maxwell polarization physics, uh, if you have uh, in the complex language for the electric field vector, the X component and Y component, uh, have a phase shift of pi half. So one of them is say i times the other, uh, then indeed you have a circular polarization case. So all of this um, translates nicely between spin and photon. And also for the photon case, there's a nice correspondence between the quantum language written down here and the classical physics of polarization. Okay, fine. Uh, one final remark about polarization. There is a little difference when these experiments are analyzed and that has to do with the angle between the two states. So if I have spin one half, then the spin up in the z direction is well pointing up and spin down is pointing down. So the angle between them is 180 degree. And so for example, for Bell, for our correlators that we like to calculate, this means that if um, A and B are the uh, plus one, each of them, if I get a spin pointing along the measurement direction at the respective station, then if I take this product and uh, average in a singlet state, we know already that we expect minus cosine of the angle between the A and B measurement directions. Um, for the photon, we have horizontal and vertical. There's only an angle of 90 degree between these two orthogonal states. So as a consequence, um, the correct result in quantum mechanics is actually obtained if you have a cosine of twice the angle between them, because you want, if, if the angle is 90 degrees, you actually want to have the same result 
as you would have for the spin one half for 180 degrees. Okay, so that's just a little side note so one doesn't get confused. Okay, so now uh, returning, returning to the possible experiments one can do. So one of the oldest experiments for photons in the context of Bell's inequalities uh, is really annihilation. So in particular, if one has positronium, which, is, which consists of an electron and a positron going around each other, so, so it's even the bound state, then they can annihilate leaving behind only energy. And this energy is in the form of two photons that are emitted in opposite directions. And these are actually kinds of experiments which were done much before Bell came up with his ideas. Um, here I list uh, the earliest version of these experiments. And it turns out if you do a careful analysis of the polarization state of these two photons, then uh, written in this horizontal vertical basis, it's horizontal vertical minus vertical horizontal. So that's, so to speak, the singlet state for the photons. One can also write it in the circular polarization basis, then uh, you would also find they have opposite circular polarizations. So that's one way to take matter, convert it completely to energy in the form of two photons, and they even have the right spin state that we like. But it's maybe not so controllable. You don't have so much positronium lying around. And so it's more like a high energy experiment. Um, what I now want to come to is more transitions inside atoms where you emit photons. And then you look at uh, situations where you emit two photons and then you look at their polarization. But before we get there, I really should uh, again take a little excursion and tell you about the, what happens with the photon polarization during a transition. Maybe you have learned this in some lecture, but I want to repeat it. So this is, of course, given by the so-called transition dipole moment. What does it mean? So let's look at the simplest case. We have one s orbital, say at higher energies, and one p-type orbital at lower energy. So I have plotted the shape of these um, orbitals here. And uh, there's just spontaneous emission, say, from the higher energy orbital to the lower energy orbital, and it will emit a photon. The question is, what about the polarization of this photon? Yeah? So maybe I know something specific. I know that the um, orbital that I'm decaying into is a px orbital. So it's this characteristic shape aligned with the x-axis. And so one way to understand in a very physical manner what is the polarization of such an emitted photon is to imagine, so to speak, that the transition is only half complete that you have gone into a superposition state of the upper and the lower orbital. So just for a moment, uh, assume that this is the case. So you have a superposition of S and of Px with some prefactors that are not so important. And each of them, of course, oscillates at its own eigenfrequency. And so if you now calculate the probability density psi squared in this superposition and plot it as a function of position in space, uh, then what you see is actually that this psi squared um, will become time dependent because you have a superposition of um, these two different energy eigenstates. So at some point in time, you might see there's some more or less um, isotropic um, cloud maybe. At another point in time, you find that because of the superposition of Px and S, you have more probability density um, on the right-hand part of the wave function to the right of the nucleus. And later it comes back to the more or less equal, su super, uh, equal uh, situation. And then you have a little bit more probability density to the left and then again to the right. So what you really see, and I encourage you all to program this on the computer and make a little movie yourself, is that the dipole or even literally the charge density, this cloud, the electron cloud oscillates in the X direction. And that's then exactly also the polarization of the photon. So it's like a classical antenna that oscillates in the X direction. Formally, if you want to do the calculation, 
Um, you don't even need to go through all of this. You can just say uh, what matters for the radiated electromagnetic wave is really the dipole operator, so charge times position of the electron. And uh, if I'm interested in the transition, I should not calculate the expectation value of this in one of the states, but really the um, matrix element, the transition matrix element between S and PX of the dipole operator. And um, it turns out that this also points along the X direction for the same reason. So a uh, superposition of S and PX um, uh, has some charge density oscillating in the X direction. Okay, so this is good to know because now we can understand better what happens if I have photons emitted from an atom and what might be the polarization physics. Now, we need a situation where we have two photons emitted and where somehow these two photons are not completely independent, but we make sure that their polarizations are correlated with each other. Otherwise, this can never work. And so um, the situation that people invented for this purpose or that they exploited for this purpose is called atomic cascade. So cascade means that two things happen in succession, one after the other. And um, this is shown here. So maybe it's good first to look at the right-hand side at this level diagram. Yeah. So I imagine I have an atom at first residing in an S state. So I don't write down the full notation for these atomic levels. Uh, typically, you would have to say uh, which, uh, which um, major quantum number n is uh, really occupied. So maybe it's a 4s state. And if I have uh, two electrons in the outer shell of this atom, I would have even a more uh, complicated notation. For me, it's just important that the symmetry is an s-type symmetry. And so the typical dipole transition then can go to a p state. And so what we want to envisage is a situation where really I did have, say, two electrons. And so um, I can have a two-step transition where I also emit two photons. And this two-step transition will go through an intermediate uh, p-type state. Now, of these p-type states, there are several, yeah? px, pz, and py. And that's the typical basis of the three degenerate p-type orbitals. And now the question is, which transition pathway do you take? And the point is that if the first photon is emitted along, along this branch, going from S to Px, then of course now your atom is in the state Px. So the second photon must also be emitted from the state when it goes to the ground state S. And likewise, if you first go to Py, the second photon also has to start off from Py. So that's the mechanism by which you get this correlation between the two photons because the, they share the intermediate level. That's the trick. Now, um, which of these states will matter or how does the polarization structure really look like? That depends a little bit um, in which direction the photons are emitted. And so the, the very clear cut simplest case I, I show on the left. So here you see an atom which emits photons uh, back to back um, into opposite directions and uh, say these directions are the z direction. Then um, we know already from classical el electromagnetism to detect uh, some far field radiation, for example, up here, you have to have an electromagnetic wave that is polarized perpendicular to the propagation direction of the electromagnetic wave. So somewhere in this plane of the two axes that are already labeled H and B for horizontal and vertical. So somewhere in the X, Y plane. Uh, and likewise down here, you can only detect radiation, which is polarized in the X, Y plane. Anything else would uh, contradict basic uh, Maxwell. So uh, at least in these directions, if you detect photons, they must have come from one of these transitions that went through an intermediate state that had uh, either X uh, polarization or Y polarization. 
And so that's why in this level scheme to the right, I did not draw a transition that goes via the PZ state simply because it will not involve, you will not see any of these PZ type photons uh, if you only detect along the directions uh, that I draw. Okay, so if you do detect um, along, these, along the Z direction, back to back these two photons, then they have either X or Y polarization. And I already explained to you that by this cascade and the atom, if one of the photons is X, the other is also X. And if one of them is Y, the other is also Y. And then we can label X horizontal and we can label Y vertical. And so this is actually the state um, that you would uh, measure in such a cascade experiment. And I think I will still today uh, come to some of these experiments that actually have used this. This is just to set the general stage. So these are atomic cascades. That's nice, that works nicely. But there's also an alternative, and that's quite famous because it was used in many uh, important experiments. And that is so-called parametric down conversion. Now, how does this work? Basically, you split one photon into two. So what you need is a piece of material because in free space, it never happens that a photon will split into two. But you need some piece of material and well, at some level, any piece of material becomes a nonlinear optical medium. Nonlinear means that if you look at the polarization, so the dipole moment per volume of this material, when it is hit by an electromagnetic wave, this polarization, of course, is um, to lowest order linear in the exciting uh, electric field. Uh, but um, if you look more closely at the dynamics of these electron clouds inside the atoms as they are... Um, as they are oscillating under the influence of the incoming electromagnetic field, you realize that the response is a little bit more complicated and you can also have contributions to the polarization that go like the square of the electric field or like the third power and higher orders. So this is simply because even if the incoming radiation is sinusoidal, the outgoing radiate, the, the resulting dipole moment can be something more complicated and also the uh, relation simply doesn't need to be linear between E and P. Okay, so this can happen basically in any medium. The only question is that in some media, maybe for so much reasons, the E squared term is forbidden and you start only with the E cubed term and so on. Um, and then what happens in a quantum language, I've tried to write down in the Hamiltonian. So uh, this maybe requires a little bit more formalism that we had chance to discuss so far. But at least those of you who have taken a slightly more advanced quantum mechanics course, well, you know that uh, harmonic oscillators are described by annihilation and creation operators. So this one uh, destroys an excitation. And in our case, we would say a photon in mode K. And this one, AK dagger, uh, creates an excitation in mode K. And so uh, this AK dagger AK does something. It doesn't do anything. It basically... Uh, only counts the number of excitations in mode K. And then you multiply this by H bar omega K, which is the energy per photon. And so if you sum this over all modes K, you get the total energy stored in the field. So that is uh, relatively simple. But this uh, nonlinear behavior that you have this uh, strange behavior in the polarization uh, for an impinging electric field, that also has consequences in the Hamiltonian of this medium. It leads to extra terms in the Hamiltonian. And these extra terms, they look like, say, one photon can be destroyed and uh, several others can be created. So there can be many terms, uh, and it dep may depend on the material which ones are allowed. But I've written down maybe the most important for our purposes. Um, it's the one shown here. So what happens here? I destroy a photon with uh, momentum K in mode K, um, and I create two photons, one in mode K1 and another in some mode K2. And if this is a extended medium, then momentum conservation will hold. So K2 will actually be K minus K1. So this is what's shown here in the Hamiltonian. It's also sh shown already here uh, in the schematic of the situation. So I sent in um, a photon of some frequency omega, and 
it gets destroyed, but in its place will be created two photons uh, with different frequencies, omega one and omega two, and also different momenta k one and k two. And it turns out that we will have energy conservation. So the incoming omega equals the sum of omega one and omega two. So energy is conserved. So frequency is conserved, you could say. And we have momentum conservation, but this is only if the uh, piece of material is really very much extended, then momentum conservation will hold and K equals K1 plus K2. And so the way one draws, likes to draw these things sometimes is in terms of these uh, so-called Feynman uh, diagrams. And in principle, you could then look at a succession of such events, but in these experiments, uh, uh, this lowest order event is really the one we care about where one photon gets split into two. And it turns out that the, um, the resulting photon pair, they are entangled and uh, they are also entangled in their polarization. Uh, but this is a little bit, um, it will depend on the details and we will come back to that. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the polarization structure, just to give a preview, it could be, say, HH plus VV. It could be something like HV plus VH. It uh, depends on the details. Uh, and in general, there will also be entanglement even in frequency and direction. So if you want to write down the total state of the two photons after this event has happened, um, then you would end up writing down a rather complicated wave function where you're sum over all possible momenta, K1 and K2, and also all possible polarizations, let's call them sigma one and sigma two. Imagine these are the uh, vectors depicting the direction of polarization. Um, and so the first photon would be in state K1 comma sigma one and the second uh, photon in state K2 comma sigma two. And as you would superimpose many of these states, each of them with their own amplitude psi, um, and so this in general would not be a product state, but an entangled state with all these degrees of freedom. And then it's, um, then it's up to the experimentalist to either select afterwards only uh, some of these photons or arrange the setup that maybe only a, a certain photon pairs can be produced. And then maybe you don't want uh, entanglement in the direction and only have uh, something in the polarization direction. Um, what favors the emission of K1 and K2 at an angle? Oh, um, the point is that you need to look at the dispersion relation of the medium. And since you have to fulfill both energy conservation and momentum conservation, it's actually not so trivial to fulfill both of them. And um, in free space, of course, I could easily fulfill uh, both of them if uh, if both K1 and K2 and K are all parallel and it's always in the same direction, because in free space, uh, omega is simply uh, linear in the magnitude of K. So, it, so energy and momentum conservation would nicely match up. But if you're inside a medium, it's much more complicated. You have some dispersion, omega of K is some, something more complicated. And then it, in general, will turn out that you will have them emitted at an angle. Um, so there's another question about the uh, Hamiltonian. So the first term is our usual Hamiltonian for the linear case. Yes, I agree. So the Hamiltonian is quadratic and the equations of motion that would be derived from them. So Heisenberg's equations of motion would be linear. And the second term, uh, yeah, the second term describes the nonlinear processes and the, this little g would uh, be proportional to some uh, polarization tensor and uh, in this case, um, if I have three photon operators involved in the Hamiltonian, I'm actually describing a so-called chi two process for any for anyone who, um, for whom this language is familiar. Yeah. And then you would have, I mean, the G would depend on details like how did you normalize your electromagnetic wave functions? What's the volume of your material? Uh, and lots of stuff like that. And if you like to be very precise, you can imagine that these K and not only involve the direction of the momentum vector, 
but also as an extra index, so to speak, the polarization. And then this G, of course, will also depend on the polarization and um, will give you the special polarization structure of the resulting states. Okay, good. Fine. So that concludes a little bit my preview of the photon experiments, but we will come back to it when I go through the history of Bell's inequality experiments. And then I want to conclude this uh, uh, section a little bit by saying some, something about qubit platforms. So this came up only more recently, say from around 2000 or so, maybe it's fair to say, um, people have been interested more and more in highly controllable engineered quantum two-level systems. They call them qubits because they are supposed to be the elements of a quantum computer. You have to have a very high degree of control, not only over individual qubits, but is even, a, um, even in terms of their interactions. And I'm just displaying here two of the most famous and promising platforms. On the left, I have trapped ions. So you ionize atoms and then they are charged. They can be trapped in, with the help of electric and magnetic fields and then they stay together and you can address them, for example, with laser fields and microwaves. And in this case, I already display that they have some say singlet state of the spin and in principle, this, these could be even nuclear spins or, um, elect or electronic spins. So these are trapped ions. And then uh, superconducting qubits is another platform. So there you have pieces of metal at low temperatures where they become superconducting. So they are without any electrical resistance, without any loss, which is good to preserve the quantum coherence. And then you can um, consider Cooper pairs that I tried to depict here, tunneling between different metallic islands and then there would be different quantum states depending on how many Cooper pairs are currently, say, on the upper island, zero, one, two, um, or minus one. You always count with respect to some reference, a neutral metallic island. And that these are the quantum states that you're playing around and out of which you can construct uh, qubits in this platform. And um, in both cases, uh, people have a very, very high degree of control over these uh, qubits. And then once you have this high degree of control, because you want eventually to build a quantum computer, uh, of course, to produce a Bell state, to I mean, to produce an entangled state, a singlet state or a similar equivalent state is one of the easiest exercises. This is basically one of the, one of the benchmark experiments that one first does as soon as one has two qubits available that are coupled. And I depict how things would be written down as a program, so to speak, the program of uh, such a little tiny quantum computer made of two qubits. Um, such a program, by the way, is also called quantum circuit. So a quantum circuit is not a physical hardware device. It is rather really this timetable or program that says which operations you take in which sequence. And so here we would have a situation where we start out with the zero state. So this is a um, spin up, if you like, you just need to define it with a zero state in both qubits. So it's a product state between the qubits. Then on one of the qubits, on qubit number one, you apply what is uh, generally called the Hadamard gate. So it takes the zero state and turns it into a superposition of zero plus one. So that requires only single qubit control. And then you let the interaction between the two qubits act for some while in order to implement a so-called C0 gate. C0 means controlled not, so you flip the second qubit in case the first qubit was a one. Then you flip also the second qubit, and in this case, it would flip from zero to one. If, however, the first qubit was in the zero state, you don't do anything. So it's really a controlled not that depends on the state of the first qubit. And so now if you follow the sequence, just a Hadamard gate and a C0 gate, and you follow it closely, then after the Hadamard, you have a superposition of the first qubit, and then you flip the second qubit depending on the state of the first. And if you think about it, this means you end up with this superposition where the states of the two qubits are correlated. So the second one will be one only if the first one is also one. 
So and there you have already have an entangled state. Now maybe uh, you don't like it that that it doesn't look like a singlet state, but that's very easily rectified. Uh, you just have to have say a single qubit operation on the uh, second qubit where the zero is turned into a one and the one is turned into a minus zero. That's a valid single qubit operation. And then um, you have a singlet state. So as I said, this is basically benchmark experiments and people have uh, started to carry them out. Now, um, these are the possible experimental systems that are available. My next step would be to tell you something about the actual history. So which were the extra historical experiments that people have done and which challenges that they run into. Uh, but before we go there, I really want to say a little bit about two of the biggest challenges that people encountered. So you already have the context available. And so um, the first one, would be about locality, ensuring locality. So we mentioned it several times. We want to make sure that the result at station A does not depend on the detector setting at station B. And well, in general, there could be interactions, even long range interactions, even a weak Coulomb interaction of over long ranges could presumably still influence the other detector station. So the way we tried to avoid this was to appeal to the theory of relativity to say light is the fastest way you can exchange signals. And so we want to set up a situation where not even light, not even a light signal could in time reach the other detector station to reveal the setting. And so I now want to be very, very precise about this point. So what I will draw is a diagram that you will see in quite a number of important articles on Bell's inequalities, which is just a space time diagram laying out the timetable of when things happen and so on. So, well, space time diagram means I have, I need time and I need space. So X and CT. Um, this means the axis, both axes have the same dimensions and a 45 degree line would indicate uh, the travel, uh, would indicate a traveling light beam. Now, um, what really matters, if you think about it a little bit, is not really when the source emits particles or whether you even have a source or anything. What really matters is, first, the point in time when you choose the setting. because then the setting is fixed. And from that point onward, the setting could be revealed in principle via a signal to the other detector station. So this point in time is very important. Um, and then of course, what's equally important is when you actually have concluded the measurement, when the result is noted down. so that it cannot be changed anymore. And now what happens is of course that um, in principle, um, starting from this point onwards, in principle, a light signal could start to travel outwards from this location of the detector to reach any other possible detector that might be around and willing to listen to this message. So it's a light, light signal. Uh, we draw a 45 degree line. And so um, this of course could go in both directions. And so if I, if I want to make it really clear, 
um, the setting could be known to any of this um, forward light cone. Yeah. So this is where someone would know uh, the detector setting. And of course, what we want to make sure is that the other, the other measurement at the other station must be concluded um, uh, before the detector setting can be known. So this would have been station A, let's say, and then there would be a station B. Maybe the choice of setting is even initiated simultaneously and also the measurement takes about the same time. And if the situation is like the one I'm depicting here, then indeed, there is no way that this measurement result, which is now noted down at this point, could have been influenced uh, by knowledge of the detector setting at A, unless we have signals traveling faster than light. And likewise, the same is true also in the other direction. The choice of the setting at detector B might uh, start to travel outward um, at the speed of light again both directions so again in this piece of the diagram the detector setting would be known um, but if station a has concluded its measurement in time before anything from b can have reached it then we are safe so this is this is the basic idea and so uh, we could say if this is the distance l uh, and this total time between setting the detector and finishing the measurement is delta t, then what we want is L should be larger than C times delta t, then we're safe. So this is locality. And obviously it requires you to measure relatively fast and also to choose a setting only at the last moment and not have it on there all the time already. Um, and it, uh, typically will also require you to have a suitable separation uh, that depends on how fast you can measure, of course. Okay, so this is one thing I wanted to say, and it's very important and it will come back several times. Uh, is there already a question here? That's conceptually important. Okay, I don't see any question at the moment. I will. Go on slowly. And then there is another big challenge for all these experiments, and that is detection. To properly detect um, uh, particles and what to do when you don't detect quite all. So um, the problem is, of course, and this was especially a problem in the first experiments, your typical detector, your typical photon detector may not be that great. Yeah? So, um, so um, at the times, uh, measurement efficiencies were very low and uh, you would uh, typically then observe only some fraction um, eta of the cases. So uh, what this really means is that if I have, say, the CHHS uh, inequality, and I take what I do serious, and I say, a and B are plus or minus one if I do detect something, but zero if I don't detect anything. That's what we said. Um, and if I take the actual observed in my experiment a value of this correlator, then I would say, aha, this is the ideal value that I would get according to quantum mechanics or whatever correctly describes my uh, current experiment. But then since 
I lose some fraction and uh, the value of A, which had been A or uh, equals plus or minus one in the ideal case will be replaced by zero. That automatically reduces the value um, of my correlator. So I would say this is something like eta A times eta B times the old correlator, yeah? Because say, if um, only 30% of the cases are really detected, the other 70% gets set to zero. And so then uh, my correlator is reduced. This is a problem, obviously, because um, if you don't want to make any extra assumptions, then you should use this correlator that is actually honestly observed in the experiment and inject it into your CHHS inequality. Now, the problem is that this correlator comes out less than the ideal value. And so at some point, if this um, detector efficiency is too low, uh, then you won't even, even in an experiment that is really described by quantum mechanics, you will not violate CHHS uh, simply because all the values of your correlators uh, will be reduced. So if this factor is actually less than one over square root of two, which square root of two was the extra factor that quantum mechanics gives you over the bound uh, from CHHS, um, then the left-hand side of the CHHS inequality will actually, from the observed data, will actually not violate the bound. It will actually be compatible with local and variable theories, even if you have set up the experiment so that the ideal values uh, would correspond to quantum mechanics. So that's a little bit disappointing then. And this, for a long time, this was the case for all, for all experiments that had been done. Yeah? And so the question is, how did people deal with that? Well, one way to deal with it is to say, look, I know that photon detectors are not very efficient. I know that this thing happens. I know that in principle, there would be an ideal correlator, but it's unfortunately reduced. The observed correlator is, is reduced. So maybe if I know all of this, I can factor this in and can, so to speak, in the end, honestly try to insert the ideal correlators that would have been obtained if I just try to um, calibrate my experiment properly and uh, extract the etas. So uh, just to understand the logic, um, we would say something like, what's the rate? Now let's talk about rates like uh, number of photons detected per second. And I could uh, look at the experimental rate to get say A equals plus one, B equals minus one, just as an example. And if I want to write down this rate, uh, it would co correspond to many different factors. It would be the rate of emission of photon pairs from my source. I don't know, one kilohertz or so. Uh, then maybe I'm collecting only photons that have been emitted into certain directions. This is also something that happened in many uh, experiments. So there might be a probability to even collect my photon pair. And if I don't collect it, it's a photon goes missing and it doesn't count, uh, so to speak. Then I multiply with my ideal, possibly um, uh, my ideal probability to have A equals plus one and B equals minus one. Um, so if I'm thinking in terms of CHHS, I would actually try in my ansatz that this could come from a local a hidden variable theory. Of course, if I want to predict the true experimental results, I will have the hypothesis that quantum mechanics holds. So at this point, I will have the quantum mechanical uh, probability. And then finally, I will still multiply by the detector efficiencies because each of them can, in addition, uh, reduce uh, my overall rate. So any sensible person would make this ansatz for the total rate that is observed in the actual experiment. And if you're willing to believe this ansatz, 
and you're willing to calibrate your detectors, which you can do in separate experiments and also say calculate or calibrate your collection efficiency and your pair emission rate, uh, then of course it's very easy. Yeah? Then you can just extract from all of these formulas the P um, that you would have. And, and all the other combinations of A and B. And this is, in any other kind of uh, experiment, this would not even be a big discussion. This would be something that you read in the fine print uh, of a paper that, uh, yes, of course, here are the ideal results from a theory, and we know that our detector wasn't quite efficient, so the actual rate is, of course, reduced, and we can have calibrated it and can uh, backtrack and obtain the true results and compare them against the theory and everything matches nicely. This is, so to speak, in the fine print of any paper. Um, here, however, one has to be a little bit more skeptical and one has to say, well, this is all good and fine if this equation that I'm writing down here is true. So if this simple model that everyone would consider very plausible is really true. And the reason why we're skeptical is, of course, because we want to make so uh, sweeping claims about ruling out any potential local hidden variable theory, no matter the details. And if we want to make these claims and talk about the foundations of physics, then we shouldn't just assume in the course of our analysis that such a simplistic model is necessarily true. Uh, but sometimes we want to assume this in order to make progress in our analysis. And this was also true for the early experiments. And so then to assume that this model is true means we are basically assuming that the loss of photons has nothing to do with, say, the detailed hidden variable state. So the fact that I lose a photon has nothing to do with the detector setting at this detector or the other detector or maybe the uh, hidden variable uh, in the photon pair. It's just something that happens randomly and independently to every photon. It's just a loss. This is what we would assume. Um, and this was summarized under the heading of fair sampling hypothesis. So this is a notion that CHHS brought up in already uh, 69 when they had their papers. So what this really means is what you need is that the detected pairs that you actually do detect and from which you extract your statistics and your correlators, they are a fair sample of all pairs. Fair means there is no bias, nothing that would change your statistics if you try to take out the calibration of the detection rates and uh, come back to the actual um, probabilities. So the detected pairs are a fair sample of all pairs. And so this hypothesis has been used uh, for a very long time in order to analyze Bell inequality experiments. There were also other versions of such hypothesis, uh, just always looking at the experiment, looking at how you would like to analyze it, knowing that it's not quite ideal, and then uh, giving a name to this assumption. But I don't want to go into the various versions that there were. Okay, so I guess this is it for today. Just a little preview. Next time, I will still take some time to go through the actual um, Bell test experiments as they came up throughout history and how they addressed these challenges, especially with detection and locality. Okay. But now I still want to give you opportunity to ask any questions. So these are things that 
need some thinking on the conceptual level. Yeah, I mean, the mathematics, of course, is very simple. Anyone analyzing some experiment would do something like this, but conceptually, it's still important. And likewise, uh, the locality. Okay, any questions, anyone? Okay, um, maybe exam questions we can ask separately. It should be in mein campus. I'm a little bit astonished. Um, I also want to point out, I forgot to mention that uh, we have put a first problem set with three problems on the website. Um, and we will discuss the results on December 16 at 6 p.m. So that's a first problem set just to get warmed up. It's about balance inequalities, of course. Okay, if there's no further physics question for today, uh, then have a good evening, I guess, most of you. And see you next Monday. <laughs>